Uh, hi everyone. Uh, so welcome to the bi-directional powered Selenium session, shaping tomorrow's automation session by Pooja Jaglani. She is the esteemed team lead at the browser stack. That, without any further delay, Pooja, over to you. Uh, thank you, Samiksha. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, hello all. Really excited to talk to you today. We will be covering, like Samiksha said, the bi powered Selenium and learning all about it and just chopping down through the code demos. So um, I think she already gave me an introduction. I'm a team lead uh, at Browser Stacks Open Source Program Office. I'm also one of the Selenium maintainers, primarily working on Java, recently JavaScript, and the focus for a couple of years has been primarily by time. And just a quick glance over today's agenda. Uh, we will start to understand what is WebDriver Classic. We'll just do a quick recap. I think most of the audience here would be aware of that. Then we move on to understand where did Baidai come from? What is Baidai? Um, then we kind of proceed to understand the difference between Chrome DevTools protocol and Baidai. That's a very popular question and it's often mixed up. After that, we proceed to see the Selenium's Baidai API in action. Uh, that is where the interesting part where you might get tired of listening to me. So we look at the demos at that point and just do a quick um, short section about how you can help us in this journey. Uh, I'll try to leave sufficient time for question answers in the end, but you can always find me in the links I'll leave at the end of this chat. So let's get started. What is WebDriver Classic? So what is originally known as WebDriver, now also known as WebDriver Classic, because we also have WebDriver by direct, just to differentiate the two. It is a web standard. Let's break the word WebDriver. Right? So it's a web standard that knows how to drive the web. That means it knows how to talk to the browser, manage sessions, emulate user actions, do all the interactions that you want, find elements. It understands to get your shadow DOM. It understands how to send JavaScript scripts to the browser. So it is essentially something that knows how to talk to a browser. It might be specific to a browser. For example, you'll have a Gecko driver for your Firefox Mozilla, you'll have a Chrome driver for Chrome, you'll have an Edge driver for Edge, right? So it has it's a personal assistant sort of a thing that knows how to talk to the browser and get to do all the things right. But what the web driver spec did was it could they create a very big specification with in a REST API format. So there's a standardized way to talk to this web driver, right? So you don't have to worry how the web driver talks to the browser. It can do it in its own language. That's great. But we want a standardized way to provide full flexibility. So there are implementations of WebDriver like Selenium, Appium, uh, Nightwatch, WebDriver IO that will send a WebDriver classic command to the WebDriver using HTTP. It's send a request. It will want to send a request to open a page. The WebDriver will go to the web browser, open a web page, and give a response that, yeah, we're able to open the web page. Once we get the response, we can take more actions, like find an element and click an element and it's a total request response uh, sort of communication that happens. We also provide some utilities in Selenium where you can wait until an element is present. But for that point, you actually have to do long polling using HTTP to keep polling. Hey, do you have the element? Do you have the element? That sort of a thing. But by far, this is hands down the best cross-browser spec that exists currently, right? And it's supported by all browsers. It's a web standard. So things were going all good and well. But that's where the web evolution came in. So right when Classic was developed, web was not as complicated. It was very simple. It was designed in mind to emulate user interactions. But with the evolution of JavaScript, there have been more complicated applications requiring you to do really complex testing, which required you to even test to the fine-grained nitty-gritties that the browsers can expose, right? You might be interested in events that happen in the browser. Right, uh, event is when something of interest happens, you want to know from the browser. For example, while testing, you want to go test the console logs. You want to know if a JavaScript exception happened. And these kind of complexities started getting added. So, but in using HTTP, you would always have to poll, right? So, how will the browser tell you when something has happened? That's when the two way communication comes in. So, enter the WebSockets. So, WebSockets have been around. For a long time, I think they provide a full duplex communication channel. That means a client can talk to the server and the server can respond to the client 
or the server can also push a message out to the client. More like broadcasting. A client can go to the server, hey, can I subscribe to this? A message of interest, and when something happens, please let me know. And the server will just broadcast when something of interest happens. So that's the beauty of WebSockets. So leveraging WebSockets is how Chrome DevTools protocol operates. What is Chrome DevTools protocol, right? I know there's a little confusion, but we'll be clarifying that in the store. Chrome DevTools protocol is essentially a protocol used to instrument and debug your applications. It is essentially used by Chrome DevTools. This is a pop very popular window that I think most users would have seen. When you navigate to a web page, right click, you can debug your application, right? You can observe there's the HTML viewer, there's the DOM viewer, you can see the console, you can see network performance. You can also add breakpoints, make changes, render it again to see how those changes look. It can do all sorts of things, but the whole goal of this is debuggability, right? So Chrome DevTools protocol essentially is used by this major tool in Chrome, but it also was adopted for automation um, by Puppeteer, right? It uses WebSockets, it provides everything. But like the name says, it's Chrome DevTools protocol. It only supports Chromium-based browsers. So there's no Firefox support, there are other browsers that will not support Chrome DevTools protocol, but it was more of a stopgap solution that was adopted by automation tools. Puppeteer adopted it and that made it only a Chromium only automation tool. Selenium adopted it as well, but that was mainly like a stopgap so that you can meet your testing needs, but it was not an ideal scenario, right? But what if I told you there was something better? something that was best of both the worlds, something that used, it had all the simplicity, flexibility, cross-browser support of the WebDriver Classic, but it also had the WebSocket support and the fine gauge control that CDP provides, but with automation in focus, right? Uh, we went over CDP, the focus, like I said, they themselves list in their definition that they're meant to instrument and debug your application mainly for troubleshooting. So now what is WebDriver BiDi? Think of WebDriver BiDi as an extension of WebDriver Classic. So it can do everything your WebDriver Classic or the current WebDriver protocol can do, and a bit more, because it's bi-directional in nature. It leverages WebSockets to do that, so that's out of the question. It can go subscribe to events of interest with the browser, and the browser can send messages back whenever something of interest happens. So now there's two-way communication with more fine gate control. Along with the development that was done for this was very solely focused on automation in mind, right? So that's why we call WebDriver BiDi the next generation protocol. It's not exactly a clone of CDP. That's not a practical thing because, again, CDP was developed just for Chrome. BiDi is developed to provide full flexibility. It could be working with any browser of your choice that you would like. It's an open web standard. It's a standardized thing that all major web browsers have operated. And the vendors got together and designed it themselves. So now that we've understood the definitions of diagrams of each of these, so we've gone through the classic. Uh, why CDP came in and why it made sense in automation testing. We also kind of covered about WebDriver by on a high level. Now let's break these two down and understand the exact differences between each of them in different domains. Browser support. So like I earlier mentioned, by is designed for full flexibility, supported by all major browsers that are out there. It's web standards that they to adhere to. Whereas Chrome DevTools protocol is solely only for Chrome embrace browsers, right? Stability. Um, if you go and search Chrome DevTools protocol on Google, you'll get the first link. You click on it, you scroll a little below, you will see that they do not guarantee backward compatibility. It can break any time. And for this reason, you might switch different versions of Chrome and your test might break, right? versus WebDriver that you would have used for years, 
even after your browser updates, nothing would break. It just stays. And, you know, updating your tests is a hard problem. Uh, due to this, even the CDP bindings in Selenium, with every new release of Chrome, we have to release version-specific Chrome DevTools protocol to a user. So they're able to use that. But if you're not updating the versions um, or if you're updating your browsers, it can just break at moment's notice and you wouldn't know. But PyDive was designed to be standardized and stable for as long as possible, just like WebDriver PyDive has been stable for as long as possible. Event subscription. Those of you who have worked very closely um, with Chrome DevTools protocol often ask that how can I listen to events or something of interest happening in multiple windows or multiple tabs in a window? Well, with CDP, you cannot do that. You will actually have to go to a window, send some commands to attach to it, then switch out and create a separate CDP session with a separate tab or a window of interest. You can't get all the global events, but Baidai made that easier for you. With Baidai, you have the option to choose. Uh, do I want to subscribe to a single tab? Do I want to subscribe to all the windows? Do I want to subscribe to all the tabs in a window? The choice is yours. It provides full flexibility and you can listen to all your events like console logs, JavaScript exception, or uh, events like, oh, user prompt is open now. User prompt is closed now. All events of interest that you would like you can listen with full flexibility. The use case, like I said. So CDP is great. DevTools are great for debugging. They let you troubleshoot your application. It makes a developer's life so, so easy. But the, it is primarily used and maintained by the Chrome DevTools team. They designed it with keeping that in mind, right? To allow debugability. Whereas Baidai is designed for automation. These are two separate use cases, right? Um, while debugging, you might need a lot more fine grain control or real nitty gritties that you might not always need for automation. So Baidai is more of a balance between what is exactly required for automation and what is safe to expose from the browser without causing any memory leaks or any performance issues. It's a practical balance as to how to make a tester's life easier while testing their application. Complexity. So I think this is something we'll see a demo about the complexity part that I'm talking about right after this. Uh, but what happens with complexity is in CDP, there are commands that to do one action, you might have to send multiple commands. Whereas Baidai was designed in a way to minimize your route trips, right? So it was made very ergonomic in nature for the user to use and quickly adapt. So that's it. Let's see that in action, though, before I talk about it. So let me just, sorry, let me just do full screen. And there we go. So what are we doing in this is we're trying to, let me pause. Yeah, so what we're doing in this is we are running a console log test of CDP. And that class just extends this dev tool space. Uh, what I'm trying to point here is that I've left a debugging point where we're trying to create a a session. I want you to look what it takes to create a CDP session, how many commands are involved. So we just quickly we're debugging this. And well, it's instantiating the tests. We have created a session. And now you can see at my debug point, I'm going to the next step. If you see so far, all I have done is just created a session. If you see here on line 38, I've just created a session. I've not done anything else. Um, let's go to the console to see the debug logs that, that are in place. So anytime you see devtools.connection send, that's where you send a command over the wire to the browser driver. That's one, that's two, that's three. Yeah. And well, that's four. And this is, mind you, just creating a session and attaching to a single tab so we can listen to events from there. So it has taken us four commands to create a CDP session with a WebSocket communication. We've not counted the two HTTP requests we sent earlier to identify which version of Chrome and get the correct endpoint for the same. And that's it. I'm stopping my tests now. But let's look at a BiDi test. 
So now I'm doing by die. It's also try to listen to logs. Don't worry about the code. I have a separate section for it later. I'm just initializing a log inspector and I mean, you don't need to know what that is. But basically this, the prerequisite of this is to have a by die session before I can start listening to a log, right? And it's open a window. Now all you see is, yeah, you just instantiated something and all you can see is there are no logs because what it does is you can upgrade your HTTP to a WebSocket connection for Baidai without any more kind of handshake steps required, any more commands to start a session. The browsers are so in sync with this. They already just provide your WebSocket. There we have it. We are ready to run with Baidai. Please just connect and start writing your test. So now that's over four WebSockets plus two HTTP connection down to like your basic one session creation connection. So you can see the ratio. Well, it's not so big when you're running it locally on your machine, but when you're running it on cloud providers like browser stack, which also support this, it's going to add a lot of latency, right? If you have so many calls and that's pretty much about it. Right? So that's when I say the complexity part happens. Now we've seen all of it. So now why is Baidai the road to better automation, right? It follows standards. Because it follows web standards, it's an open web standard. You can go look at the spec. You can go see what they're working on, what they're deciding on. You can even make suggestions. It provides a lot of flexibility for a user to use a tool of the choice that supports this and use a browser of the choice that supports it, right? The second point here would be it's backward compatible. It's currently work in progress. But once it's fully fleshed out, you can just use it for years to come. Again, with the tool of your choice that supports this for different browser versions, and it's not going to break. It's going to be consistent, and that's a guarantee. It's also designed with automation scenarios in mind. So the common automation scenarios that you would face end-to-end, -end, it can be solved with by die. Yes, maybe not a single by die command, a bunch of it, but that's automation tools job. They will provide things out of the box for you, but it's designed with that in mind. Additional benefit is it's complementary to the existing web driver classic protocol where consider it as an extension of the same, right? So you can get the same benefits, but now with a dual communication channel. But there's also a lovely option after that where you can have only a by die connection. So you don't want to do the HTTP route. You want to develop your own client that knows how to talk to the browser using by die. You can do so. You can have only a WebSocket connection, only by die focus connection. They have all the plugins or all the correct things instrumented for that. It also leverages performance driven design. And when I say performance driven design, let me clear that a little bit. So Chrome DevTools protocol, most of the times your DevTools will exist on the same machine as your browser. So the communication between the two is a short round trip, right? So it's, it can easily be low latency and it can be very chatty and that's totally fine. But now imagine that we are running tests with a cloud provider or a device farm. Again, like something like browser stack where I'm sitting in India and suppose I'm running tests all the way in the US in a device farm that browser stack provides there. Now that becomes high latency. So it's designed to make sure that you get maximum out of a single command so you're making minimum round trips and it's supporting your automation needs in the best possible manner. And the last but not the least, I think uh, first I would like to thank these folks. It's the WebDriver by Die working group. Uh, so these are all the major browser vendors, automation tools, um, stakeholders like Sauce Lab, Browse Tag, all of them sit together to design this protocol. So all stakeholders are accounted for they're voting for an issue. They have put in deep thought into developing this protocol. So it's developed with a lot of effort, time, and thought by this group. And I really appreciate the time here. Well, I think you've heard me talk for over 20 minutes now. And uh, like promised, we will go through Selenium Spidey in action. So this is just some common code. So we will be going through the code snippets and videos of it. 
and so that you can see what actually works versus me just telling you, you know, actions speak louder than words. But one thing to notice here is this is a common test setup when in the before section, I'm initializing the options of the browser. But to enable BIDI currently, you have to set a capability. So you have to set WebSocket URL to true. That's your indication to the browser that, hey, can you give me the WebSocket that I need to connect to and just run with it. And the second part is um, we're just initializing the module we want to work with. So it could be you want to work with logs. There's a log module, script, script module, network, network module. We'll again break it down in the further section. So I think this is a common scenario that we face in these days. How can I listen to the console logs, right? How can I get my console logs while running a test? So again, this is a simple Java test where we are initializing a log inspector and then going on console logs. Just give me what you got. And we are doing a basic assertion. So we are going to a web page. We are finding an element that will generate a console log. And then we're just checking that have we got the correct console log, right? Same way you can do it for JavaScript exceptions. I know this is a very famous uh, use case or very popular use case or often asked use case that people come with that I want to know what exception happened. And that is great. You should be testing how the exception handling is done in your test. That's that's perfect way of operating. So again, it's a similar structure, but instead of now log inspector dot on console logs, I'm like on a JavaScript log. Can you just notify me? Right. And again, we go to web page, click on something that throws an exception, and then we just check that, oh, am I getting the error details that I want? Yes, now it's the fun demo time. So it, it's exactly the same code. It's just snippets of the same code, and I'm running the test to show you it work. Yes, we did one test case. Second, just bear with me while it runs all this. Yep, our tests are passing. It's the exact same thing. So don't worry, all the examples are available for you to use. It's adding assertions to see we got the console log. It has more, again, it's the same code base, more assertions here for JavaScript. Now let's go and look at actually what happens and what we tested. So this is a web page that we've navigated to. So when I click on console logs and I open my Dev tools for Firefox. I see hello world, and that's what we've asserted for. And when I click on an exception, it throws an exception. And again, that's what we have asserted for. Right? So that's the log part of the things. Now, how about listening to events from a specific tab or a window? Like I said, it's something Chrome doesn't let you do, but it's something you can easily do with Baidai with full flexibility. So let's say I've opened a web page, right? So I've opened a tab. In a browser, I opened a tab. And I have my, I've subscribed to events only from that particular tab. Now I have opened another tab, right? But I've not subscribed to events from that tab. And I open the tab, navigate to a page, which fires, say, console logs. Okay. I'm not going to get it. So I'm not going to get the WebSocket is saying, you've not subscribed to me. I'm not going to send you the logs. Though there's a console log, it's not of interest to you. But I will send it to the one that is subscribed to me, right? This is one scenario. You can also have a scenario where you want to globally subscribe to all your tabs and windows, and you can just do that. Just initialize the log inspector with a driver, and you're good to go. By default, that's the thing, right? So how does this work in action? So how we are subscribing to a single context. Context is nothing but a unique ID for your tab. Again, let me finish running the test. So we opened a tab, switched to another one, switched an event and got. Now let me just explain this a little bit. So what we ended up doing is we opened a window. Okay, that's fine. We started with a tab. So the first tab, we subscribed that to the log events. Then we switch to the second tab. 
we did not subscribe that to the log event we did some actions there were events it didn't get it so anything there would pretty much time out but when we switch to the original tab again it has all the events so essentially the point being you can have a multi tab scenario pick and choose what you would like here we just took two tabs subscribed in one then subscribed in the other and the one we didn't subscribe and didn't get the event so if you're waiting for an event there it will time out and the one you subscribe to will get an event that was the test now let's move on to the next scenario preloading a script so what is preloading a script right so preloading the script is the script that will execute first when you open a new window or a tab before your actual author or user scripts execute so what do we do you can add a preload script here i'm saying console.log welcome to this page right so i've added a script and then i'm testing it that when my window opens ideally it should have had a console log so I'm, i have more statements or code here to check if i've received that console log right so i navigate to a page i open a window ideally the script that prints a console log would have executed and i should be able to get that log and assert it so this is the code for the same we are preloading a script i'm just debugging here so i can pretty much show you we've added a preload script and that's great and now we are running our test before we do that since we did a preload script we did no other step right you should see in the console that you're able to read the console message that the script has executed before anything else could execute and then you can remove your preload script as well and that's totally okay and here you can see all steps like adding a script removing a script and that has happened and then you can unsubscribe to your event and you're good to go I'm just going through the logs here so uh, and i think this is very useful for most users in most testing scenarios where you would want to uh, set a base for your test you might want to run some scripts get something in a particular state before you can run your tests so that's what this is very useful for again full flexibility you can just run your preload scripts for every new window or only some selected tabs or windows again full flexibility is provided here now this is one of my favorites it's sandbox scripts but can we first understand what is the sandbox so we all know that when you open a browser you have a tab so when you run something in a tab it's all okay what happens when you open another tab are the changes of the things that happen in first tab affecting your second tab no right unless of course they are the same application but let's not get there um so i say i'm i opened a website in one tab it has a lot of dynamic content that's happening whatever scripts are running it's in its own sandbox it's in its own isolated environment right they are not going to affect the things happening in my second tab i can have a different website running parallelly they will coexist they're not interfering with each other your dom is rendering perfectly you are even able to run your tests perfectly so these are isolated environments right though they are working in the same bigger container but they're isolated from each other and still the same browser engine is able to give you that beautifully right now what is a sandbox script so say within a tab you have another isolated environment where you can run some script now these scripts will have access to the dom but will not be affected by other things happening outside right for example say you open say you want to run a script in a sandbox environment but you don't want any interference from a third party plugins or um, third party ads or any other scripts that are happening outside the sandbox right you want to test something so you can test something within this isolated sandbox you can run a script and within your tab you can have multiple sandboxes they know how to coexist they will run what you need but they will not be aware of each other so changes made in this isolated sandbox only stay in the isolated sandbox they will not be available outside the sandbox right 
So the, let's see this in action. So since we've seen how Selenium does it, I'm also showing a demo how we can do it in Selenium Grid um, or using a cloud provider like Razstack which supports BiDi beautifully. So you set your Firefox options, your cloud vendor options for Razstack, whatever um, OS version you need. Okay, so let me just pause here. So to enable BiDi again on a Razstack, you need to set the Selenium BiDi to true. And it will intrinsically set the WebSocket URL to true and tell the browser that, hey, please support BiDi for me. And that's all it's doing. I'm just going over this because it's a little different setup than we spoke about earlier. You initialize the remote web driver. You want to talk to a remote web driver. And then you can initialize your script module. So this function, so this sandboxing script commands execute or they are under a script module and hence why hence that's why we have a script class. Now we will quickly go over. So while this runs, I will just quickly go over the code with you. So what we do is we first make changes without the sandbox. So we're just calling a script, not passing any sandbox parameters. So just in your tab, we are saying set the variable window.foo to one. Okay. We're just setting it to one. That's all we are doing at that point. Now we are trying to get that result, but this time we are passing a sandbox variable. So, I mean, you can give any name to a sandbox. So now we have an isolated environment. That is no idea of the variables outside it. And we're checking, can you tell me what is the value of the variable? But it doesn't know it's outside. It's isolated from the changes made outside. So it won't know. And that's exactly what happens. We, I mean, it was a successful command. But the result we got was undefined. It's not defined. So for the sandbox, it is not aware of the changes that has happened outside its isolated world, right? Now we make some ch changes in the sandbox. Now we go in the sandbox and like, hey, I'm setting a variable inside you, okay? And that's the value for that is two. Sandbox like, okay, I'm okay. Thank you. I know the value. And now we check. And now we ask the same sandbox, can you give me the value? Right? Can you give me the value that's set in this environment? And now it knows, right? So when you check for the value, you should get the value two, which is what we exactly set. And yeah, and now let's look at the successful run. The test has passed while we were talking. Let's look at the detailed steps that have happened. So this is our run on the cloud that has happened. And if you can see um, at every second, these commands have gone through beautifully. We can see how we made a change without the sandbox. We can see that we tried to find the sandbox. It wasn't there. Now we made change inside a sandbox. Since it's in the isolated environment of sandbox, it knows. Right? So this is what you can do. Again, there are lots of use cases that can be tackled in your sandbox. There's just a plethora of things that can happen. Now let's move on to the next popular use cases that a lot of people use with CDP. This is the uh, basic hi, auth. Uh, hi. Just, uh, you know, sorry to interrupt you. Just a reminder. It's 11.05 and we have 10 minutes left with us. Okay, sure. We should be able to wrap this in the next five minutes. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I think one common scenario that we have is um, you have your username password pop up and you want to ensure that you're able to fill in the username and password and go on. So here you're doing a simple thing. You're adding an intercept so that when please intercept this network request when authentication is required. And when that ha event happens, I want to continue with the authentication using the username and password. That's all. And once that setup is done, you can go to your website that asks for an auth, and then you can verify that things were authenticated. Next one is intercepting request. Again, network interception is a very, very popular use case. So here I'm just intercepting a request. I want to observe the request that's coming in or going out. Okay. So I can add an intercept it before a request is sent. Just pause this request. So each request that's outgoing will be paused. Okay. So when the request before it's sent, what you can do is you can get all the timing information of the request. So when before the request is sent, it will send an event to you. And the event will have all the request details. 
here i'm just printing some information timing information so i can also measure performance in the future if i want to you can extend it and then i just continue the request that please continue and that's totally okay next similarly i want to intercept a response so before the browser is sending the response i want to intercept it so that's what i'm doing here and before the response is sent it will give me all the details of the response that here i'm just printing out which url was this response for and then just letting the response go through it's again just observing the network traffic in different ways you can do a lot more things with it and you can see that in all sorts of examples in the selenium repo let's have a quick demo for this i'm just running all three tests it's one test suite Yeah, I know they were pretty fast, but these are just. Let me just quickly go over through the next part of it, where you can see the logs. All tests are passing. It's authenticated. We see that the assertion has worked perfectly fine. Right in the request one. Right now, we are able to see which request did we send to, because that's what we are printing, and we also got some timing info. Right, some request information that we wanted to print. What was the request time? What? How much time did it take? And it's all out there. and then similarly again so it sent out two requests one for the web page and some other icon and it's all printing what it's required and for the response we just printed the, this is the response i sent i responded for this url and that's pretty much about it again um these are not super exhaustive we can do a lot more things with it but that really depends on your use case So yeah, we are almost coming to the end of our session, and let me tell you how you can help us contribute to the Selenium's by Dai journey. You can actually try out the code examples. You can let us know if there are bugs and errors. If you come up with an interesting feature request, please shoot it us. You want to discuss some ideas, want to doubt solve, come to the chat room, have a conversation. we are more than happy to help you understand what it's like to contribute what it's like or how can we help with contributing or making the feature a reality you can have documentation so with documentation is the one of a very good ways to get started with the open source projects so like documenting examples um maybe even explanations or even writing blogs more than happy to support that you can also help make some noise about it so if it could be in social media twitter just make everyone aware of this lovely new protocol that's up and coming um these are just links if you all want to just quickly if someone wants to screenshot it they can um yeah so it's basically links to the issue for the github like if you want to get started you can go to the first link want to understand the by dai spec i've left a link for it web platform test is where the browsers um, indicate as to what test they are running how much of by dai have they implemented and they've implemented a good chunk um then a link to our code examples in a documentation and if all fails we're always there in the chat room on slack and irc matrix just to say hello and, and that's about it thank you for being a lovely audience i have 5 minutes for questions so there is one anonymous attendee's question when will by dai be released for usage Uh, so Selenium by by what you saw, it's already released. So Java and JavaScript parts have implemented majority of the by by spec, so that's available for usage. You can go try the latest version, and you'll have it. I was running tests in the latest Selenium version. Um, for other languages, we just started a release process last night, so they're in the next version. For .dot net or uh, Python. they have some high level apis that they put in place it is a work in progress but it's something for selenium i will definitely have but it's ongoing process you can already start using but full fledged probably by selenium i will have a full fledged usage but we're already working on it actively and making progress okay uh, so the next question is how can we use web driver by dai features with remote web driver instance instead of chrome and firefox driver instance is it possible to extend web driver by dai documentation with remote web driver instances yes so i shared an example just now but you are right we can extend that in our documentation how to do it with remote web driver instances i already shared an example where i showed you how to use a remote web driver 
on a cloud like browser stack and uh, run tests on it but yes if you want to contribute we are happy to receive your example as well after this talk but i am also happy to um, add that bit from our end um so the by driver so the web driver by driver features in browser stack i showed an example that we just did right so all the by driver features that are available in selenium are also available in browser stack rush act supports by die and you can go ahead and just run your test and you're good to go i showed an example today you can set your options uh, just make sure you enable the selenium by die flag to true and you're good to go okay. yeah how can selenium by die handle browser crashes or disconnections during test execution and that's a that's a fair question so i understand the web socket connection and that is a concern we have outgoing issue for it where we want to work on making sure that the session connection is stable we are doing most check before sending commands and how also we are reestablishing connection in case connection is broken so this is something we are aware of currently the focus has been to work on getting all the bida apis in place and then next step is to how to optimize it for you okay So the next question is: Can we use WebDriver by Dai in mobile app as well? I think you can. So Appium has also. Uh, so again, this depends on the mobile app OS and things like that. But uh, Appium has also adapted a few WebDriver by Dai implementation, like the console lock parts. As long as I know, there was some uh, implementation done by uh, Jonathan from Appium. So even that is going to soon be a reality as we move towards it. And uh, thanks, thanks, Pooja, for your time. It's a, it's, a, it's a very good session. So that's about it for the session. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you, Samiksha, for driving this. Really appreciate your time here. Um, okay. Goodbye, everyone. I'll see you in the hangout section.